Dobro večer svima i dobrodošli na drugi, drugi simpozij o snazi evolucijske misli. Neopisivo je zadovoljstvo vidjeti da ste se okupili u velikom broju i drago mi je da, da mogu danas u Zagrebu predstaviti svima vama profesora Roberta Triversa. Ovaj video je kratki isičak iz nadolazećeg dokumentarca o njemu koji prati i njegovu autobiografsku knjigu Wildlife koja je izašla i dostupna je na Amazonu. Tako da se veselim ovom predavanju, vjerojatno više nego iko ovdje. Ovo je nakon dugo vremena da je profesor Trivers došao u Evropu jer ga je navodno jako teško izbaviti iz Jemajke gdje sad boravi, tamo mu je prelijepo. Ali nakon ovoga Berlin, nakon Berlina London i onda se ponovo vraća tamo, tako da smo mi imali sreću ga ovako dobiti na prvoj točki njegove nekakve europske turneje. Da ja sad probam objasniti što je profesor Trivers napravio u svom životu, mislim da je pre prekratko i premalo vremena sada da krenemo, ali možemo samo reći da negdje 70. gore na nekom naboju kreativne energije koje je vjerojatno osnovne za pamćenu znanosti je isproducirao četiri rada koje su promijenile u potpunosti način na koji mi gledamo svijet, životinje, ljude, sve. Sve ono što smo razumili kako je nekako nastalo od vrijeme Darwina, sve te ideje koje su se stvarale, on ih je uspio obličiti u nešto što je fantastično, elegantno i jednostavno. Zašto su, zašto ženski spol, spol izbiljivi, kako to da smo altruistični i dobri prema drugima, iako im nismo rođaci, kako se priroda pobrine da je omjer spolova jednak i ovaj... Zbog čega su roditelji potpisi nekad u sukobu ili u konfliktu. Ali profesor Trives nije stao dalje, on je nakon što je isproducirao to i promijenio cijelo polje evolucijske biologije, otišao dalje, posvetio se, kao što je sam rekao, civil rights movementu, posvetio se nekim drugim stvarima i onda se uvijek vratio sa nekom novom idejom i ponovo, recimo, obogatio psihologiju i antropologiju sa svojim teorijama samozavaravanja. I sad još uvijek generira nove ideje, generira nove isljeđivačke projekte i ovdje će predstaviti po prvi put neke stvari o kojima sad razmišlja i neke ideje koje muče znanost i znanstvenike danas i neka njegova viđenja kako bi se ti problemi mogli riješiti. Tako da ja bih vas samo zamolio da sa velikim pljeskom pozdravite profesora Roberta Triversa. I don't know how this thing is supposed to work, but I, I don't want the slide on yeah, here no, now. But I can't turn it off. You can't turn yeah, it off? Go. Yeah, just leave it on that. Good. If, if we need. A, it has a, like a delay when you click it. It takes some time. Oh, wait a second now. So this runs the slides? Yeah. Okay. On. So we don't worry about that. Right. And, and if you need Can that. you people hear me back there? Yeah. Nazrovia? Yeah. <laughs> or, or whatever? Um, I would thank you for the introduction, but I don't speak a word of the language you were speaking. So I will just thank you for the, now, is this on too? Yeah. Just in case. Just in case. Okay. Well, if, if people start hearing double sounds, please uh, warn me. Anyway, let me thank you. Uh, Igor, most warmly for the invitation to come to Croatia. I've been looking forward to this visit now for months. It's a fabled country. I have a number of very jealous male friends because I've been telling them, I don't know whether it's true or not, that uh, Croatian women are famously beautiful. So there's a whole set of men in Jamaica and in New Jersey that think I'm parting on down right now. Now, Igor has yet to introduce me to a single woman, and <laughs> I do hope that before I leave Friday, I will have met a woman or two, you know, um, to back up this story. I've only spent one day in your country. I uh, arrived overnight 
yesterday, Amsterdam, and then here. So all, uh, I did enjoy some nice drinks last night, but all I really know is my hotel, which I'll say two things about. First of all, uh, I was stunned by the fabulous breakfast this morning. I'm so tired of going down, you know, you're on a visit somewhere for breakfast and they have a coffee, they have one croissant, they have a little orange juice and maybe a little thing of yogurt, that's it. I walked down there, whoa. First of all, they had 20 different kinds of pork. Well, I don't, <laughs> I don't eat pork, so that didn't interest me. But they did have a slice of uh, roast beef they had fish, which I definitely eat. They had olives. They had grapefruit. They had really good juice, uh, plus the yogurt and so forth and so on. So I was very impressed by that. The other thing is a joke. Everywhere else in the world, when an elevator starts to close, if you stick your hand in there, the elevator opens. Not in Croatia. <laughs> It's like the elevator door is talking to me and saying, I'm a Croatian elevator door, and when I start moving towards the right, I keep going no matter what you do. I've had my hand stuck here, you know, trying to get the damn thing back out. Um, anyway, so now how on earth did I get stuck with a title Feminism, transgender, homosexuality, and honor killings. Well, uh, there were some British people that were inviting me to give a talk, and so they asked me to send them a bunch of topics. So I sent them a bunch of different topics, and they just grabbed four of them uh, and just said, well, you're going to talk on all of these. I warn anybody who's here because they want to learn about transvestism, you can exit right now, because I don't know much about it. I'll tell you what little I do know, but I don't know much about it. Now, uh, I'm going to start with uh, how the feminists responded to me way back in the 1960s. So that's the first wave of academic feminism. Now, there have been multiple waves. I notice, you know, there'll be some article saying, no, I'm a post this feminist, and I'm a this or that feminist, and I'm against this. I don't keep up with it. So I'm just going to tell you how they reacted to me and how naive I was thinking that we were going to form, uh, we were going to be uh, close allies. Transsexuality, I'll tell you what I know about it. Uh, transgender it is here. And then homosexuality is something that I have studied for 45 years for a very simple reason. If you're a theoretician, as I am, then you're naturally attracted to, or you ought to be naturally attracted to, precisely those areas that appear to contradict your theory at its deepest level because uh, those will be the most, maybe the most fruitful uh, to, to figure out. Now, the theory that I bought into uh, when I he heard it, and it took me about three days to master it, and uh, um, it, w it was so simple, I can give it to you in, in two sentences. In every species, there is variation in nature in production of surviving offspring, sometimes called reproductive success. Some individuals leave many surviving offspring, others leave few or none. By definition, the inheritable traits or genes, as we would call them now, of those that leave many surviving offspring become more numerous. The genes of those that leave few or none become less numerous. That's natural selection. What does it tend to, to, to put together? What does it tend to knit together over time? Genes that contribute to survival and reproduction of the individual. It's variation in individual reproductive success. It does not favor what's good for the species. It does not favor what's good for the culture or the group uh, per se. 
for it to benefit the group, you have to add a little additional argumentation. So uh, if natural selection is always selecting for increase in reproductive success, how on earth did homosexuality evolve? And did it evolve? Okay, finally, something else that uh, appears to contradict evolutionary theory and in a most ugly way are these so-called honor killings. Because there, you have close relatives, often the father, sometimes the uncle thrown in, sometimes a brother, and sometimes mom murdering an adult child that they produce. So they've invested 18 or 20 years of their life in raising this child. It's usually a girl, but it's not always. There are honor killings where the victim is a male. Uh, how on earth does natural selection favor that? Well, in trying to work out the logic of it with a close friend of mine named David Haig at Harvard, uh, who's a superb evolutionary geneticist, uh, we've come up with a theory now that's ironic uh, because uh, it's associated honor killings uh, most strongly with cousin marriages which tend to raise degrees of relatedness between individuals and that normally would be expected to decrease conflict. But under particular conditions that I hope to define for you at the end, it can have the reverse effect. All right, let's go back to, to uh, uh, me and feminists and so on. So the second paper I wrote was, was a general theory for the evolution of sex differences in all creatures using a sex-blind variable, which was relative parental investment. How much is each sex investing in any given offspring? We know in our own species, it's nine months out of the woman's body before the child even appears. The father may be bringing food and protecting and so on, but he ain't necessarily doing it. And if you look at total parental investment over lifespan, the evidence would suggest that males in our species are not quite up to female standards. But the general rule is no male parental investment. It's always female parental investment. In almost all species, parental investment ends with the production of eggs. And of course, it's mom that produces the eggs. Sometimes the male contributes, uh, nutrient-rich spermatophore, blah, blah, blah. But there was a sex-blind criterion for uh, the evolution of sex differences. And furthermore, it seemed uh, in, on two different grounds that there's a natural female bias in the living world. It's not quite emphasized. You don't hear people talking about it. You certainly don't hear the religious types uh, saying, you know something, God is almost certainly at least two-thirds female. No. It's a male-dominated perspective starting with religion or ending with it. I don't care uh, how you put it. Now, why do I say that uh, there's a female bias in the natural world. First of all, uh, only females uh, in many species can produce offspring out of their own body. And that's the defining characteristic of life. You can take a rock and smash it into a whole bunch of little rocklets that they haven't reproduced. They don't grow back into the original size rock. All you can do is smash them into even smaller rocks. Living creatures are defined by the fact that they can reproduce. They can make a copy of themselves. Okay? Now, we happen to know the most recent fossil was discovered the other day is 3.8 billion years. So let's just round it off and say that of the six, five to six billion years that this planet has existed, life has been on it for about four billion years. Now we know that for the first three and a half billion, really, there were no males. There were only what I would call females. So it could be a bacteria, it could be a single cell uh, organism, 
uh, like a protozoan. However, it uh, divides in two and makes a copy of itself, full set of genes going in there, and it grows, and it later does the same. So, females came first, and males didn't appear until somewhere 300 million, 400 million years ago, and in plants probably first as a hermaphrodite, not even as a separate form, just uh, a male part to a flower, that also had a female part, okay? So that's number one. Number two is that if our concept of the key driving force in life, as I've described it, natural selection is correct, then offspring come first. Or in your value system, you might expect them to come first. Second comes the primary investor. That's females. Last, least, and hardest to justify come males. Okay, so I had this kind of logic going on in my brain while I'm trying to lay out a general theory for the evolution of sex differences. Um, and uh, suddenly I, I hear about feminists. So I say, wow, maybe I got an ally out there that'll see the world the same way, because mine is a kind of feminist, or at least female-oriented uh, approach to things. Whoa, how naive can you get? The feminist took one look at me and made the sign of the cross, you know, uh, because I was the devil, or uh, uh, the devil's best recent representative, because I was a biological determinist. Now, why was I that? Because I argued from natural selection. And natural selection only makes sense if it's accruing genes, if it's changing gene frequency. So therefore, I believe the genes ruled. So therefore, I'm a genetic determinist. They were into eradicating any kind of biological differences between the sexes other than these and these and these. Uh, in particular, behaviorally, they wanted to make it clear we're identical, okay? We're not different. So, I think to myself, wow, that's a stupid approach to, to life. You lose two things. First of all, you're willing to throw out all of biology. For what? For cultural anthropology? For sociology? What on earth are you talking about? So tossing all of biology out the, the door seemed to me a little bit premature and uh, unwise. Um, and then uh, um, and then they were implicitly modeling the superior sex on the inferior one. I'll make the superior sex be females, and they're trying to say, hey, we can be just like men. We can be just as overconfident. We can be just as unconscious. We can be just as biased in our thinking, and there's evidence for each of those assertions. Uh, we can be less socially aware, and we can use our brains more asymmetrically. That would be if women are as unfortunate mentally as are men, okay? So this all just seemed like madness to me, and I just paid no attention to it. There were other people, pseudo-Marxists then, these were the early 70s when everybody was politically conscious uh, for a while, and uh, so there were other people uh, uh, running after me as being a biological determinist. But anyway, this is a feminist, and so I just didn't pay any attention to it. It seemed absurd on its face. Let me mention a couple of facts there, or just enlarge on a couple of facts there that are relevant that you probably don't know. We did not know this at the time, but it turns out the brain is the most genetically active tissue in your body in the sense that 
more than 60%, about two thirds of all your genes express themselves in the brain. You see, genes, you know, express themselves in particular tissues. Kidney relevant genes express themselves in the kidney. That's about 17% of genes. The tissue that has, that's next after the brain is the liver. About 30% of genes express themselves in the liver, and that's, we believe, because the liver detoxifies your body. You know it takes care of alcohol, but it takes care of an endless set of chemicals, and it needs to have the chemical variation to detoxify them, get them, flush them out of your system. But the brain has, uh, uh, besides the housekeeping genes, maybe 20% that's true of all cells, it has a whole series that are unique to it. We got 20,000 genes, so 12,000 genes are active in our brain. Uh, within each of us, if you go down 10% uh, of the loci are heterozygous, in other words, you have a different gene from mom than you have from dad. So if you just uh, take your 12,000 and take 10% of that, there's 1,200 genes in you, which are where the copies differ uh, left to right inside you. Never mind the variation within your family. So indeed, I've, I've often thought, especially you know when I had children and so on, that uh, you, you can spot genetic resemblance in your children. You can say, oh, that's a Trivers trader. Oh, that's a staple trader, blah, blah, blah. But by the second generation, grandchildren, it's already hard to pick out you know, what exactly is that? Probably because it's a combination. So <laughs> if you want to start out by assuming that genetically uh, we're all behaviorally identical, uh, you, ch you chose the wrong tissue to make that argument. It's, it's the other way around. I mentioned uh, that women use their brains more symmetrically than men do. Uh, you don't see that pointed out, uh, I don't see it pointed out by anybody, except the neurophysiologists that showed it, and they don't make much of it. However, it, what they showed was, if you gave uh, men and women two different tasks, one was arithmetic, on which men will tend to do better. One was verbal, in which females will tend to do better, but these were constructed so that the, on average, the two sexes did just as well on both. Then you can show uh, that the brain, you can show which sections of the brain light up while you're solving the problem. And what you find out is female brains light up more symmetrically. Both sides are lighting up and they're solving the same problem. Male, she's got a big flash here and otherwise not much going over here. Female brain is more symmetrical. Now, is that just a single finding? No, because the two halves of your brain are, are connected by something called the corpus callosum and that's where information is shared uh, directly between the two halves of the brain and yours, I'm talking to the women in this room, is relatively larger than is a man's. If you got the same brain size as mine, you as a woman have a bigger corpus callosum. So you're anatomically set up to share the information more. Furthermore, they recently shown that it doesn't apply to all fibers. If, if you start studying the corpus callosum more closely in terms of which fibers are, are going back and forth. Uh, you know, and this is a technical field I really don't master, but just the conclusion was that it's only, you know, some, whatever percentage, that uh, 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 show a larger fiber on the female side than the male, but these are specifically those associated with higher cognitive abilities. So on higher cognitive abilities, your brain is acting more symmetrically. Now, in general, for a bilaterally symmetrical organism like ourselves, we regard symmetry as an advantage. For example, 
and this involves a brain, by having two different ears that are placed so as to you know, hear sounds from any given direction, we get uh, the ability to locate where sound's coming from. This ear, by the way, is just for decoration. It don't work anymore. So if someone calls me in Jamaica on my field, I say, wave your arms up and down. And then I go like this until I see someone waving their arms up and down because I have no direction. If you only got one ear working, you don't know what direction a sound is coming from. Likewise, the fact that our eyes are in front of our face and our field of vision overlaps very strongly gives us depth perception. Otherwise, I can't tell the people in the front row from the people in the back row, so to speak. Okay, so here are two examples where symmetry gives you extra powers. Now, I just speculate and wonder, you know, you know, do women have a sixth sense? Some psychologists are starting to write about a possible sixth sense, but you know, it's at its infancy, even defining what the sense would be and so on. But I wouldn't be surprised if the symmetry of your brain gave you some extra powers, and I also wouldn't be surprised if they related to social interactions, because uh, for example, women have been physically weaker for however long, at least five million years. And that has given a male an advantage, which sets up a selection pressure for the female to be able to manipulate the male, sometimes against his you know, consciousness, or in any case, handle the social situation so as to minimize uh, the harm. So you expect women uh, to be socially smarter, and that's my experience. I tell young men, I say, listen, if you've been going out with a woman for six months and she doesn't know you better than you know yourself, you're going out with a slow woman. <laughs> so. so, so much for feminism. Uh, now let's turn to transsexuality, or transgender as it's called here. Uh, and I was just reading, uh, you know, generally the transsexuals prefer, at least in the U.S., to be called transsexuals and not transgender. So this is a morph, a form, that we never would have predicted. No one did. You know, it's XY, XX. Yes, we're aware of XYY males. We're aware of XXY Fem uh, males, again, uh, indeed, uh, nearly 1% of everybody is mismatched at their X or Y. You can have XXX women and so on. But, um, but never mind that. Uh, tr transsexuality is where they're creating a morph. So you can, you can transit in one or two directions, of course. You can transit female to male. Now, to do that, you simply try to cut down on the testosterone. You can do that by, if the uh, victim or the individual agrees, uh, take off his uh, seed bag, as they call it in Jamaica, testicles and so on. That'll get rid of the testosterone. Or you can allow the testosterone to pr be produced, but you can give them chemicals that bind to it and get rid of it so it, it is no longer acting directly on tissue as it was before. Um, and, um, and then you increase the estrogen. Now, all of us make both sex hormones. You women produce testosterone naturally. I'll show you when, when I actually show you some slides, which will only be on homosexuality. I'll, I'll show you variation in testosterone level in women and what it correlates with in terms of their sexual behavior. And men produce estrogen. It's just that women produce a lot of estrogen and just a bit of testosterone and men are the other way around. So you start giving this male to female uh, transsexual lots of estrogen, you block the testosterone. 
Now, you can go all the way, I'm told, and I don't want to see a picture of what a, a surgeon comes up with when he's trying to create a fake pum pum. But in any case, I'm told that they will take the dick and loop it around backwards like this so that the glands of the penis, this little thing here, you know, the, the highly sensitive tip of the penis, becomes the clitoris. And the two are homologous. They're the same blessed structure, okay? So it makes some sense. They strip away the tissue. I don't know the details on this, but keep the nervous connections, flip it around here. And so now this male to female uh, transsexual has a clitoris. And they actually enjoy sex more than do the female to male transsexuals, which I'll come to in a second. Um, now, as I say, how the surgeon makes a vagina I don't know, and I don't want to know. And I don't want to see what it looks like. The real thing is one of the more variable and complex structures, uh, you know, uh, that I've studied intensively. I don't know how to speak about this uh, uh, in public. But anyway, uh, uh, so anyway, they, they make a fake vagina. Now, the, the transiting the other way works remarkably well at the external level. Oh, by the way, I mean, you can give, once I've gone through sexual maturity, you can give me estrogen till I fall over, and I'm still gonna have this Adam's apple. I'm still gonna have, actually, I have small hands, me and Donald Trump. Uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, men tend to have bigger hands. And that uh, was always a classic way of telling if, if someone in a dress is really a man, is to look for the Adam's apple and look for bigger hands. Uh, but for the female to male transsexual, you just start giving them testosterone. And one guy described it, it was like going through adolescence. Uh, and I mean, he had a full beard, make uh, Igor look like he's uh, fresh uh, shaven. Uh, so externally, they quickly take on male characteristics. Their problem is, is how do we arrange the orgasm? So I, again, I haven't gone into detail. They got some inflatable something, and then maybe if you take enough Viagra, you can get something. But they enjoy sex less than do the male to female transsexuals. I'll just end this topic by saying that uh, it's changing as we speak because they're inventing, uh, I just uh, read, uh, I don't know, a couple of days ago while preparing for this that they've, they've now got a different way of, of uh, dealing with the dick instead of bending it around and having it come out as a clitoris. So it's, it's changing every day. And secondly, they're starting it earlier and earlier. I saw some show on TV where these parents are looking at their three, four-year-old boy and saying, you know, let's start. There's no doubt that he's a girl. So let's give him the estrogen now. So God knows what the morphs are going to look like if they start early enough and if they keep, you know, technological inventions. Um, the frequency of individuals is it's fairly low. It, the estimates will vary, uh, but it's on the order of uh, one in a, a thousand to one in 30,000. It ain't, it ain't a large number, okay? Now, I mentioned to you, let's see if I can get this sucker to work. I mentioned to you that I'm, I'm pretty up to date on homosexuality because I've been studying it for 40 years. When Hamilton's kinship theory came out, it said, hey, it's not just personal reproductive success, you're as related to your brothers and sisters as you are to your own children, so in theory, a gene that increased your brothers and sisters more than the children you would have had will spread, which it will. Uh, so a bunch of people jumped up and said, oh, that's the explanation for homosexuality. It's kin-directed altruism, 
I'm saying I lived out near San Francisco at the time, which was the capital of gay America in the sense that people were out. There were more homosexuals in New York City, but they were more closeted and, and hidden. So I knew that it was, I knew just from knowledge of, of San Francisco, this was a most unlikely explanation. As I like to put it, Western Union offices are not full of homosexual men on Friday wiring money back to Iowa to help their relatives. They're doing one of two things. They're either partying on down. This was before HIV, okay? The non-discriminating sex goes out looking for the non-discriminating sex. If you can't get it on, you got a problem. It's us non-discriminating sex going out looking for you discriminating sex, women, that slows things down. So there were two lifestyles that were well known at the time, either orgy, 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 you know, every night or something, uh, which is gonna suck up the resources that might go to relatives. The whole problem with homosexuality being a kindred uh, behavior is that uh, the sexuality is interfering with it. If they were non-sexual, there might be some chance. And then the other thing, which is now much more prominent now that uh, gay marriage is legal and so on, is two men living together. Uh, but if they're middle class, they don't have children. So they're living upper middle class life because they're not reproducing. So that was an attractive lifestyle. Again, nothing going to Iowa. So kinship had nothing to do with it. Now, let me just mention a couple of facts and then I wanna go through some slides with you. There's no question that there are genes that are associated with male homosexuality. Male homosexuality in various places where it's been studied, but certainly I can speak about my own country uh, with some assuredness, is about 3%. And that's you know, obligatorily homosexual or very, very strongly homosexual. Uh, and that's way too high to have resulted from an a unfortunate mutation that's reappearing, because then it would only be one in 10,000 or one in 50,000. 3%, how did it get so damn high, is the question that I'll address. Now, women, uh, it's like one to 2%, but they're more f flexible. They're uh, more bisexual in a genuinely bisexual way. And, uh, but there's no evidence of genes affecting female homosexuality. If you're a lesbian, there's a higher frequent chance that your sister will be as well. But since the two of you were raised in the same home, that doesn't discriminate genes from social environment. And that's the only correlation we have. Whereas you'll see on the male side, we've got correlations with other relatives that aren't being raised in the same household. Um, so, let me see if I can work this damn thing. Da 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 da! What the hell is this? Oh, okay, fine. First of all, is there homosexuality in, in nature and other animals? Yes. And I'm gonna give you two examples that have been around for 30 or 40 years. There's a, you know, there's always a gay guy that comes along that writes a book called Nature's Rainbow. And he's gone and collected every single homosexual act that's been described, and you can get quite a collection of them. All right. But let me give you a couple of the classics. This is a gull, and I think it's a herring gull, but this is true of the western gull, New Zealand gull, a variety of gull species. They first of all discovered nests with more than three eggs, and three is the maximum that a gull lays. She may lay only two, but it'll be two or three. Now, they lay them every two days. So what the scientists did was to mark the eggs, and sure enough, you can see the two black stripes there. You can see one over there. Sure enough, they're appearing every day. And they watch them. Both females are laying eggs. So it's a female-female pair. 
Gauls, it's very hard to tell the sexes. So it was indirect, the discovery that there were lesbian pairs. All right, fine. Now, if you watch them, they form a pair, and in this case, uh, one of the females may be bringing nesting material to the other female. Uh, they will sit on the eggs, you know, four hours each, just as a heterosexual couple would do. They copulate, and either one can go on top, or both can go on top, let's say. You're a couple? All right, I'll let you go on top now. Fine. You may know bird sex lasts for about two or three seconds. Gone. <laughs> uh, the one thing they don't do is courtship feeding. And that's where the male brings food to the female uh, during the time when she is forming the eggs. Now, whoops. This damn thing is going crazy. Ah, good. Uh, okay, this is percentage of chicks uh, that are hatched, and the white is a heterosexual couple, and the black bars are uh, lesbian couples. So, uh, percentage of chicks hatched that fledged you can see about 60% uh, of the, those that hatch actually fledge, that is, fly away, the chicks. But for the homosexuals, it's just 20%. Uh, they're, they're more missing and they're more dead, if you look at the black bars. Uh, these are two different years uh, showing you the same relationship. So they're not as successful uh, but uh, from this, we do know that uh, often, or at least some of the time, uh, females, uh, s s some of the time, females copulate outside the lesbian relationship. Otherwise, you wouldn't get any eggs hatching. Okay, so that's evidence that at least one of them is having sex outside the pair. Fine. Whoops. Yeah, okay. This is a chimpanzee copulating. Uh, that's the male. This is doggy style, as we call it. And that's, of course, the common style in uh, chimpanzees. But bonobos, which used to be called the pygmy chimpanzee, but it's just a smaller species. There are two species of chimpanzees. We're equally related to them, about five... Uh, five, six million years separation is guessed from the paleontological record. Now they have something like this, which is the missionary position as it's called, uh, where the male's on top and the female's lying there, perhaps enjoying it. Now, this is two females and the female here is holding on to the other female and this is her feet, and she's pressing her genitals against the genitals of the other female, and then they do what's called GG rubbing, and God knows I can't act it out, but <laughs> something like that and real fast, you know? You really get into it, but something like that, I don't know. So. Now they've, you know, they've studied it, it reduces tension and conflict, you're more likely to do GG rubbing if you've just joined a group and want to kind of ingratiate yourself in it and so on. So this is just a couple of examples of it existing in, in other creatures. By the way, do you have a watch or some chronometer? I, I hate to not know what time it is. I mean, just lend it to me, if, I mean, unless you're attached to it. Um, yeah, thanks. And then, just to keep me conscious now, this is almost a full hour, so do I have 15 minutes? 20, I'd say. Huh? I'd say 20. <laughs> I'm, I'm starting to like you. So I got 20 minutes. All right, fine. Now, 
This is a male reaching over and squeezing the erection of a friend of his. Now, what they've done is just heard a neighboring chimp group, and they do murder each other, uh, hooting and so on, so they're uh, aroused, you know, in a defensive way. And uh, so he, one guy's got an erection, this guy reaches over and feels it. Now, another thing they do uh, in response to hooting of a neighboring group is they will mount another chimpanzee, a uh, male mounting a male from behind, uh, while both are standing up. Uh, no penetration, there's no sex, there's no erection, and it is the dominant that allows himself to be mounted because what they're trying to do is get a group together to defend themselves against this neighboring group. So in that case, by me being the dominant one saying, all right, you, you can adopt that position, that means, hey, we're on the same side now. All right, fine. Now, there's two genes that have been located, and, and this is, you know, this, work, this particular gene is, work has been going on for over 20 years. The eighth chromosome has another gene that appears to increase the chance of you being uh, male homosexual. But we're sure about XQ28, which is, let me see now, is this what points maybe? Ah, yes. So this is the X chromosome. The small arm is P, the big arm is Q, you number down here, XQ28 is down here. Now, why was it interesting when the first male homosexuality gene, oh, and this was discovered, uh, by the way, when they noticed, as you'll see shortly, that male homosexuality is only inherited on your mother's side, not from your father's side, and that suggested the chance that it was on the X chromosome. Each male only has one X chromosome, so they took two gay brothers, and they would line up the X chromosomes and just go down and see if there was more than a 50-50 chance that they shared the same markers. And at XQ28, it jumps up, uh, as you'll see in a moment. Uh, so that was the evidence um, that uh, there was a gene or genes. We still don't know what it is. We, we've only used markers, which are little fragments of genes. Uh, okay, one possibility is, we've gotten rid of kinship, one possibility is that it's a sex antagonistic gene. Now, what's a sex antagonistic gene? A sex antagonistic gene is one where if it's in me, it's positive. If it's in a woman, it's negative, or the other way around. There can be one that's positive in you women, but negative when it's found in us men. Now, if it's located on your autosomes, your regular chromosomes, then benefit better be greater than cost, or else it's going to be flushed out. So if, if it's a gene that, that harms me by making me homosexual, it better benefit my sister even more than it harms me for it to start to increase in frequency. Ah, but if it's on the X chromosome, it is less restrictive because uh, all you women have two X chromosomes and all us men have one. So a typical X chromosome, if you ch uh, check it out, spends twice as much time over evolution inside a female as a male. So if the benefit in a female is just greater than half the cost, not greater than the full cost, just greater than half the cost, it'll start to spread. Why? Because it, 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 it enjoys the benefit twice as often as it suffers the cost. All right, fine. Now, here was a follow-up study that nailed it down that where we were really confident that there was a gene or genes involved. So what they did now was to look at families where there were two gay men and gay brothers and a heterosexual brother. So they looked at XQ28 and just the hell is going on here? Oh yeah, good. Just as I mentioned to you before, there was almost a 75% chance 
that they each had the same XQ28 when 50-50 is what you'd expect by chance. How, however, if one was gay and the other was heterosexual, you drop down to about 30%. So they're discordant. So they ought to be discordant at XQ28, exactly as they are. No effect on females at all. They're irrelevant to females. Okay. Now, this is an ugly slide, and forgive me. Uh, you can look down here below and get the, the inheritance uh, of uh, maternal uh, of an ex. It's shared between brothers, but as I said, it was sisters for lesbians. That doesn't say anything because they're raised in the same family. Now, if you look at your father's lineage, there's no increased chance of uh, male homosexuality there. But if you look at the maternal side, then maternal uncles, which is your mother's brother, has got an increased chance of being homosexual. It jumps from 3% to 7%, and that's statistically significant. Maternal cousins jump to 8%, and that is also st statistically significant. Brothers are at 14%, but as I say, uh, that's expected both on, uh, in terms of the X chromosome and, um, and uh, common rearing, perhaps. Now, okay, so women with XQ28, are they reproducing more than women that don't have XQ28? In other words, is there any evidence that this is sex antagonistic? And the answer is yes. Uh, mother, if you set up a, and this is in Italy, if you set up a hundred homosexual men and a hundred heterosexual controls where you match them for age and any, any other variable that might confound uh, your result, then you find that the mothers of homosexuals, their grandmothers and their mother's sister all have higher reproductive success, more surviving offspring than those of heterosexual men. So this appears to be, suggest uh, a sex antagonistic effect. Um, let me just read you. Oh, okay, good. Whoops. I don't know what the hell I just did. Um, so then they did a study more recently, of XQ28 putative females uh, to see how they differed. So what they did was to look at mothers, grandmothers, and maternal uh, aunts um, of gay men versus heterosexual men. And they found that XQ28 females were more fertile. We already know that. They have more surviving offspring. They had less uh, complications in pregnancy, uh, uh, le less, uh, there's a particular uh, disorder related to pregnancy that they also have less of. Uh, they are uh, funnier, happier, more relaxed, have less family problems, and uh, less social anxiety. So this is just a suggestion or a hypothesis that these women are more attractive. Um, at one point, I used to joke, you know, uh, what's the benefit? I say, well, given the, the kind of cretins that you women have to deal with, having an extra gene in you that makes you like men might be worth it. No, it, it does not change the woman's heterosexual attraction, so far as we know, or sexual behavior. But it appears to change variables that may make her more attractive to her mate or potential mate, and that translates into higher reproductive success. Okay. Now, let me give you another example, which we know is not genetic, 
Oh, by the way, we don't know for sure when XQ28 operates, but we presume it's in utero. Okay, that is you're born with it. And let me just make a statement on that right now, because I understand homosexuality is something of a controversy here in, um, in dear old Croatia. The conservative Christians in the U.S., they like to emphasize that homosexuality is acquired, not inborn. You, you weren't born with it. If you were born with it, that sounds like God's plan screwed up. Or God meant you to be homosexual or something like that. Whereas if it's something that happened to you after you were born, that suggests someone messed up uh, how they raised you. Okay. But the evidence, such as it is, uh, suggests these things are working very, very early. Now, here's another one. How many older brothers do you have? There's a 30% higher uh, chance of you being homosexual with each older brother. When I lecture to undergraduates, I, I, you know, to keep them from getting frightened, I say, listen, if you have five older brothers, relax. Your probability just went from 2% to 2.6, one older brother, then 3.2, two older brothers. You finally get up to about five. So you have a one in 20 chance of being gay. So just relax. All right. Now, the putative explanation for this, and there's no follow-up work, I mean, you know, I could have said this to you 20 years ago or, or 30 years ago. Uh, we do know that the mother forms an antibody. Antibodies are what you usually form against a parasite to uh, grab it and disable it. Uh, there's the f mother reacts against the, an antigen, a particular little section of the Y chromosome, as if it was foreign, which it is. She ain't got a Y chromosome. She's never seen one in her life up close, so to speak. Uh, so she forms an, an antibody to the Y antigen, and they suppose that with each successive son, she produces more of the antibody. But they don't know whether the antibody increases testosterone level, decreases it, has no effect, or whatnot. It's just supposition. Uh, fine. But I wanted you to have one that's not genetic. How many older brothers you have is not a genetic trait, it's a social trait. Now, here is the best predictor of whether your child is gonna be gay or not, and that is called childhood atypical behavior, or sex atypical behavior. So this is a little boy, and he likes his dolls. And so that's the, that shows up early in life. And it is the best predictor, then, of whether your child is going to be gay or not. I was speaking with someone today, uh, actually, who was uh, interviewing me, and uh, she was mentioning that she was sure that her, her whatever, 12 or 13-year-old boy, 12-year-old boy, was going to turn out gay. And I said, why? And I finally got her to fess up that, that the first thing she noticed was that he played with dolls all the time. All right, fine. That, oh, that's not it for slides, no. You're gonna like this one. This is for you homophobics in the audience. And homophobia really is a misnomer. It's, it's like being fear of, of homosexuals, but it's really aggression. Uh, so they, they have a homophobia scale. How angry would you be if you saw two men holding hands? How distressed would you be if your son's gym teacher turned out to be gay? Blah, blah, blah. So you then divide men into two groups, those that are hyper upset and aroused, hostile, versus those that are relaxed. I must say, for a long time, I've been in the second category. I remember when I was 22 and they said so-and-so's gay, and I said, great, that's one less man competing for women. You know? I, I couldn't see what the downside was from my standpoint. So anyway, they did the following work in Georgia. They uh, had uh, A1 heterosexual men, Kinsey criterion, never had a homosexual experience, never had a homosexual fantasy, never even had a homosexual thought. 
All right, so they get a bunch of A1 heterosexual men, and then they split them into homophobic versus non-homophobic. Then comes the fun part. They show them dirty movies, but being good scientists, they go to the trouble of tying a plethysmograph to the base of each man's dick in order to measure quite precisely changes in circumference. All right, and that's what you're gonna look at here is changes in circumference as this pornographic film is shown. Here's a man and a woman making love. This is uh, in minutes, I believe. Here is dick size growing steadily. In fact, I think it can still has a little bit to go after six minutes. Now, the, the two are statistically identical, so I won't tell you which is which. Now they watch two women make love, and they start out strong, but for certain reasons, uh, it tapers off. Again, statistically identical. Now you're probably guessing what's down here. Here's our non-homophobic man. He shows a small and statistically insignificant increase in tumescence, okay? Here's our homophobic man. Dick starting to grow, whoa, taking <laughs> off here. Continuing to climb. He's two thirds of the way up to seeing two women make love. And this guy is rabid against homosexuals. So they then asked them also, how hard did your dick get and how excited were you? And five out of six are accurate as measured by the plethysmograph. These two are accurate, these two are accurate, and this guy's accurate. The only guy that's inaccurate is him because he denies arousal and he denies that his dick is getting larger, which is quite a trick because it's clearly getting larger and there's something tied to it that ought to be focusing his brain on it, you know. So what is going on here? Um, Freud coined the term reaction formation, where there's a negative trait in you that you don't like, and you have a reaction against it. This can all be unconscious, you understand. And you then deny the trait, because you don't like it, and you then project it onto someone else, and then since you have a negative reaction to it, you attack it in the other person. That also acts as camouflage, you know. Oh, Bob isn't isn't gay, listen to how he talks about gay people all the time. So uh, there's now a second study that uses a completely different methodology where they're showing something to the brain a third of a second. So it registers in the brain, but not in your consciousness. And they can show the same damn uh, effect, exactly. You must have read about this Muslim guy who goes into a homosexual club in Orlando, Florida, and kills 51 people. Typical American event, you know, we got the guns and we like to use them and blah, blah, blah. All right, turns out the guy that used to go to the club and not just to scout it out and say, all right, here's where I gotta stand in order to kill the maximum number of people. From accounts of people there, he had relationships. The one I liked best was a guy that said, he never had a relationship with me, but he came up to me and said, if I were gay, you're the kind of guy I'd be attracted to, which kind of says it all. So this is not no just hypothetical thing. It shows up over and over and over again. Uh, it shows up in murders of transsexuals uh, on the streets in New York, by the way. A uh, guy will even know or suspect or be attracted, but then his friends make fun of him. Uh, oh, you didn't know that that's really a man, and then the guy goes and kills uh, the poor victim. Well, by God, this must be it then, brother. Uh, is there something? Oh. Oh, wait. Why don't I toss this at you, although I, honor killing is going to have to be quick and dirty. Uh, it's interesting that there's another relation, effect here of being in the closet. Hell, I'm going to lecture on deceit and self-deception. I might just spare you this. The simple fact is you're healthier if you're out. If, if you're HIV negative and you're out of the closet, 
then, well, <laughs> I give up. Um, if you're HIV negative, you suffer bronchitis more often if you're in the closet. Uh, you die of cancer uh, quicker if you're in the closet. So not suppressing a part of yourself, but being open about it, it appears to be intrinsically healthy. It has to do with the immune system. Um, the, the evidence, all this evidence was reviewed in a book I did on self-deception. All right. I wish I could uh, turn this off, but I can't. Let me turn to honor killing. In June 2007, three men were convicted of the murder of a 20-year-old woman from South London. Only one of them had actually taken part in the killing, which was particularly savage, but the others had ordered it. The murderers were hitmen who strangled the victim, stuffed her body in a suitcase, and buried it in a garden in Birmingham. They boasted that they had stripped and raped the young woman before her dreadful death, and all but one of them disappeared from the UK shortly afterwards. They want to get back to a country where they don't bother prosecuting that crime. But in the UK, bless their souls, they prosecute. And they do in the US, and, and I trust they would in this country as well. What made the case peculiarly horrible was the fact that the two men convicted and sentenced to life imprisonment for ordering the murder were the girl's father and uncle. Let me read you uh, five examples real quickly because they show the kind of social pressures that are behind this thing. A Jordanian murdered his sister who was raped by another brother. In other words, she dishonored the family by getting raped. So it's her problem. So now you've got to murder her. Just utter madness. The family tried initially to save its honor by marrying the victim to an old man, but this new husband turned her into a prostitute and she escaped from him. The murderer confessed that if he had to go through it all again, he would not kill her, but rather would kill his father, mother, uncles, blah, 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 blah. An Egyptian who strangled his unmarried pregnant daughter to death, unmarried and pregnant, and then cut her corpse in eight pieces and threw them in the toilet. Shame kept following me wherever I went before the murder. The village people had no mercy on me. They were making jokes and mocking me. I couldn't bear it and decided to put an end to this shame. That's why they call it honor killing. They're being dishonored and that's socially contagious. A 25-year-old Palestinian who hanged his sister with a rope. I did not kill her, but rather helped her to commit suicide and to carry out the death penalty she sentenced herself to. I did it to wash with her blood the family honor, blah, blah, blah. Uh, a young Palestinian who murdered his sister who had been sexually assaulted. Uh, so, you know, it, it, it has nothing to do with, uh, necessarily with the woman having done anything. She existed. She was sexually assaulted, for Christ's sake. Uh, before the incident, I drank tea and it tasted bitter because my honor was violated. After the killing, I felt much better. Uh, another Palestinian who murdered his sister. I had to kill her because I was the oldest male member of the family. My only motive to kill her was to get rid of what people were saying. They were blaming me that I was encouraging her to fornicate, blah, blah, blah. Uh, it can be as trivial as finding a condom in your daughter's purse. It can be as trivial as finding phone numbers on her cell phone that you're unaware of. And, you know, they should just be relatives, let's say. Uh, in the U.S., the most common reason given by people that do this thing is the child was acting too American. Well, if you've ever been to the U.S. or know about it, we have one of the strongest, if not the strongest, youth cultures in the world. And any child that comes to the U.S. at age two or whatnot from wherever, by the time they're 14, whether from Zagreb or Guatemala City or wherever, they want to act like a U.S. teenager. The, the, the culture is so strong. And so these, these children are merely acting the way their culture, their new culture, allows them to do. Now, what's my explanation for all this? 
My explanation for all this has to do with the strong association between honor killing and systems with first cousin uh, marriages, and that's Islam. The other religion that encourages it, but not as strongly, is Hinduism. And that's harder for me to work out because there it's more based on caste. You cannot marry below your caste or out of your caste. You've got to stay within the caste. But in the Hindu religion, there is a bias against marrying within your subcaste. So they have a bias against close inbreeding, but by, uh, breeding within your caste will lead to some uh, um, inbreeding. There's also a difference in that in the Muslim case, it's your own family that does it. And so it follows Muslims uh, wherever they go. They go with these honor killings. The honor killings I've described to you there in England are not Hindus. Why? Because in, uh, among the Hindus, it's the village council that rules that so-and-so must be killed. And there is no village council in England. So it disappears entirely. One generation is gone. But among the Muslims, it's there because they keep up this first cousin marriages. I can give you statistics from one city in England that are kind of dramatic. The city is called Bradford. 15% of the city are Pakistani and Muslim. 55% of their marriages are first cousin. So it's not just that they're not marrying a non-Pakistani, they ain't marrying a Pakistani that ain't a first cousin. All right, their rate of genetic abnormalities is like 10 times as high as the non-Pakistanis in the same city. Uh, for certain reasons, it got hooked up with uh, the Arab area, uh, Islam, 8th, 9th century, and um, uh, what the hell was I going to say about that? Um, oh, it was interesting for me to read that in various uh, wealthy Arab countries, like Saudi Arabia, Qatar, those kind of places, uh, to get married now, you have to go to be genetically tested first to see whether there's any kind of sharing of bad recessive genes. So they're conscious of the fact that they're, you know, they're still practicing cousin marriages. And parallel at that, father's brother, which is especially dangerous, you know, dad and the uncle uh, murder off uh, someone. There was a murder that I usually start with uh, where the woman survived. And as usual, she runs away either from, you know, some pig they've stuck her with or whatever. And they come to her, the father and her uncle, and they say, come on back home, your mother misses you. All we want to do is bring you home to say hi to mom, then we'll bring you back. Complete lie. They take her to a river, the uncle strangles her, she passes out. The father shoots her, but he's so incompetent, it only goes through, I think, her jaw and maybe part of her front brain, so she survives. They put her inside a bag and they toss her in a river. They drive off. Now, uh, the cold, wet water reviver, she gets, she gets out of the damn bag, you know, and manages to come to shore, manages to get up to where the street is, flag down someone, take into a hospital, survives the whole damn thing. But uh, that was typical elements. All right, here's my argument. Let's, let's say we're concerned, uh, let's say it's my daughter and I'm concerned that her behavior is affecting other relatives. Well, uh, let's say nephews and nieces. I'm related to her by a half, I'm related to them by a quarter. So I'll value her twice what I'll value them, which is ought to protect her to some degree. But imagine this is a society that has cousin marriages. That drives degrees of relatedness up. Eventually, they approach one and then in all directions. Not only are you related to your daughter by one and your grandchildren by one, you're related to your nephews and nieces by one, you're related to your cousins by one. You see, now if she dishonors the family, now there's a whole series of individuals harmed 
to whom you are as strongly related as you are to your own daughter. Let me give you a specific example where you have a first, where you first go in for a cousin marriage. Let's say you decide to marry your cousin or reproduce with your cousin. Okay, you're half related to the child by being the parent, then you're one-eighth related to your mate and half related through your mate to the child. So it's a half plus a sixteenth. So you go from being related by eight sixteenths up to nine sixteenths. It's an increase of about 6%, and we have data showing, suggesting that the harm of inbreeding is of, of that kind of order, 5 or 5 to 10%. So they're kind of balancing. But from the parent's standpoint, they're related, uh, they're related to your child by a quarter, and directly, in other words, I'm the grandfather now, this is my daughter, and she's had a child, so I'm related by a half times a half, plus she just mated with my nephew, and that's her cousin, and so I'm related by an eighth through him. So my degree of relatedness goes from a quarter to three-eighths, from two-eighths to three-eighths. It increases by 50%. So, and this is inevitable, you can, sh this is trivial to show in any kind of kinship system that the parents are always going to be more likely to value the inbreeding than the offspring itself. Okay, fine. So, we believe that this cousin marriage, repeated, 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 has driven degrees of relatedness up, and it has the ironic effect of encouraging this kind of dreadful behavior. We also think that one reason why they make it so dreadful is also to scare other women into not misbehaving. So, you know, rape her, strip her naked, do this, that, and the fourth thing in public before you then murder her. We also believe that inheritance of, uh, that this stuff first had to do with inheritance of herds of animals and then land, uh, especially if there's a male bias for passing it down. I'll just skip all that. In a way, I regret that I didn't save transsexuality for the end, then we could end on an up note, you know. But let me just, let me just quote summarize by saying that if one had accepted this nonsense that was so strongly entrenched in the social sciences and the humanities at the time that biology is intrinsically uh, nasty and immoral, then you wouldn't have heard any of these arguments. You wouldn't have heard an argument about homosexuality. You wouldn't have heard an argument about uh, honor killing. I'll just end with a joke as to what it was like then. In 1976 or something, when this stuff was out there and people were outraged, I flew down from Harvard to New York City to give a lecture at a conference on child abuse. I didn't know nothing about child abuse, but I had written the paper on parent-offspring conflict. So they had me give the first lecture. You know, this is kind of like the background. And, uh, but it was three, 400 people there and not a single evolutionary biologist. These were doctors, nurses, and public health people. So I had been out trying to enjoy the nightlife a little bit, and I show up at 7.30 in the morning, and there are three people there handing out leaflets that say that I'm the nearest thing to a Nazi since Adolf himself. You know, so I say in my best Southern accent, how'd y'all know I was gonna be here? And the woman, who was attractive, said, I won't talk to a, a racist, sexist, fascist pig like yourself. I thought, wow, I've hit the trifecta, you know. <laughs> I'm all three. And then I thought to myself, well, racist, I don't know about that one. I just left my dark-skinned Jamaican wife back at home with our 
you know, two-year-old mixed child, and we know a lot about racism, but we don't quite, you know, classify ourselves that way. Sexist? No. For reasons that I've argued with you back when I was talking about feminism, I didn't accept that at all. Fascist? Sure. I do have a nasty personality. Uh, you know, press me hard enough and you get to experience it. Enlarge your sense of fascism, so it includes that. I sign a board to that. But in any case, um, thank you again for the invitation and thank you for assembling such a huge crowd of, uh, I trust gorgeous women, but in any case, <laughs> friendly uh, Croatians. Thank you, Professor Trivis, for a great lecture. And uh, if you're up for it, we can take some questions now. Sure. Ima koga ko pitanja ruke goru. Tamo skroz gore. Hi, Dr. Trivers. Um, I would like to ask, you spoke about female sexuality being more fluid maybe than male sexuality. Yes. Could you speak to maybe an evolutionary perspective as to why that is? Well, um, I haven't thought too much about that. Of course, one difference is that women can reproduce uh, whether they enjoy the guy on top of them or not. And so, uh, one fact that I left out, I, I think uh, maybe it was a slide that got deleted, is uh, there is a study on bisexual women uh, out of England that had some interesting results. Bisexual women start reproducing earlier than their heterosexual counterparts, but they also stop reproducing earlier and they have lower net reproductive success than uh, their, their heterosexual uh, counterparts. Um, there is also data, and I just could not find the slide, and I even had my assistant looking for it. Um, a heterosexual man uh, smells, women smells, and they go to a sexual center of the brain to be analyzed. Everything else, males, onions, garlic, so on, go to the olfactory bulb and are analyzed there. Now, heterosexual women are the same way, only it's male smells that are analyzed in the sexual part of your brain and female and onions and garlic and so on together. Now, homosexual men uh, are the reverse of heterosexual men. Uh, the smell of men is analyzed in their sexual center. The smell of women, along with onions and garlic and so on. Now, what I couldn't find was the slide of women because it, it was kind of bimodal there, uh, on the lesbian side. That is, there were women that were clearly over there. Um, um, you know, preferring the smell of women. And then there was a clump of them that was much closer to being ambidextrous. By the way, again, a slide that got deleted there, uh, but would interest you, I think, and, and I promise to refer to it, is a good friend of mine who was the expert on the waist-hip ratio, uh, he did a very interesting study of uh, lesbian couples, and... Um, he took their testosterone, this is the amount of circulating testosterone, not bound to anything, but circulating in the blood once a week. He measured their waist-hip ratio, and he had the couples 
take a butch femme scale. A butch is a masculine lesbian and a femme is a feminine lesbian, okay? And there's some little scale you fill out and you, this is self-rated, butch femme, okay. Now, what they found out was that um, uh, butches had uh, more circulating testosterone and more masculine waist-hip ratio. Well, you know, women, it's like 0.7. Uh, this divided by the biggest part around your rear end is about 0.7. Uh, but it was up to 0.8 in the case of butch lesbians, whereas with femme lesbians, they were down in the same range as heterosexual women. Uh, also, there, there were some behavioral differences where the butches, uh, if, if they were, um, if they found the other individual had played around on them, uh, the femme would cry and the butch would beat up the femme. Uh, get drunk and beat him up, yeah. Uh, those combining those two male characters get drunk first and then beat her up. Uh, so I don't have I don't have any particular insight on that subject. Uh, uh, just find it interesting. One other thing, they took a, gr a group of bisexual men. Okay, these are self-described bisexual, and they gave them. Uh, showed them dirty pictures, and it turns out that very, very few of these bisexual men responded sexually to both sexes. Two-thirds of the men responded to men. So they were really homosexual men, but defining themselves as bisexual. A third re responded to women sexually, pictures of them, but describe themselves as bisexual. Now I emphasize to people, you know, sex ain't just visual. You can be sitting in a movie theater in dark and someone puts their hand on your parts and you can get aroused and all kinds of stuff, I imagine. Um, so it's not just visual, but I did think it was interesting that in terms of self-described bisexuals, they're actually visually one or the other. They're not visually both. All right, thank you all. More questions? Uh, since I'm an economist, I have to ask, um, in economics, we usually have firms that, let's say, discriminate, perish in the end. You, you um, usually have what? Say firms. That firms that discriminate, they perish in the end. They, they are, you know, they leave the market. And uh, when it comes to group selection in honor killings, uh, how persistent is this kind of behavior and whether it actually, you know, um, shouldn't be, I mean, should we even be worried about this kind of behavior because as you mentioned, you know, there are genetic malformations and they kill their own children. Um, should we be worried that these kind of groups persist over many generations? Do you understand? Should we be concerned? Well, the, I mean, Eventually, they're doing something wrong, so they must perish after n times of reproducing. Are you talking about honor killings now? Yes, I'm talking about honor oh, killings. Oh, okay, good. Uh, well, it's an interesting question. I, I, I'm, not, I'm not a master of this yet. It's a, the whole honor killing thing is complicated, and I'm still you know, halfway through the literature on what the correlates are and where it's found and where it's not found and so on. For example, no case in China whatsoever that I can find. That's 20% uh, of all human beings. But if you ask Chinese about it, they say, oh, well, we're, we're against uh, second and third cousin marriages. And if you ask them why, they don't cite deformities. They say it makes the child duller, which it does. They're not as smart. And China, where they force their children to learn, what, 2,500 characters that all look identical, have been putting an emphasis on brain power for a long, long time. But as for, uh, so, to get back to your question, there are social pressures now in Pakistan, in India, uh, at the governmental level or at the level of... Uh, uh, NGOs or, or conscious organisms that are standing up and speaking against it. 
so there's some movement there. Uh, whether it's going to have an effect or not, I don't know. One thing I didn't have a chance to get into is that you can buy your way out of these uh, crimes in Pakistan. Uh, you just have to pay the victim's family a certain amount if it's not your own family uh, to buy your way out of it. You can't buy your way out of it in England. You're going to prison, you know. Um, so speculating on, on how long these groups might last, I'm, I'm just afraid I... Uh, I'm not very good at that, and I have no good sense of it, you know. Uh, I like to say that I can predict into the future about 20 years at most, you know. God knows if you had asked me a year ago whether the United States of America would produce this cheap con artist as a possible president of the most powerful country in the world, I would have said, you're stone crazy, and you should either smoke less marijuana or more marijuana, because <laughs> you're talking foolishness, you know? By the way, I like, I like economic data. Uh, there's one little one I'll give you, just, just because you attach dollars to it, and dollars mean something to people. So in terms of benefit and cost, it, you know, it's often, you know, right there in front of you. So they did a study of women who were not on the pill, who were strippers. Now, they worked in a strip club where the men are not allowed to touch them or anything like that, right? They're up on a table or whatever the hell they're doing, and they'll, they'll toss money, okay? And when the stripper is done, she collects her money, and she comes back later and strips. Lo and behold, it peaks at ovulation. So the men, through some means or another, are detecting that she's at that stage, which, of course, is a stage when having sex with her might lead to progeny. It's doubtful that they're smelling it because of the distance, whether she's more erotic and freer uh, at that time, who knows? Um, that's about all I got to say on that, Miss. Thank you uh, for uh, the lecture, for the questions. One more, we can take one more, and then we got to wrap it up. What can we say? Uh, thank you very much for your lecture. Uh, I completely understand that there is a more related uh, connection between you and the kinship if there is a lot of uh, first cousin marriages. But I don't quite understand how from this does it follow that there is any selective advantage in killings? Well, I mean, that's a good question and I didn't, I'm, I didn't get into the societies deeply enough to answer your question, and I'm not sure, I, well, in fact, I am sure I'm not there yet, okay? Uh, that's, I was mentioning at the end the importance of uh, either rules of land inheritance or cattle. Uh, cattle were believed to be the first case where we had a resource that could be passed on generation to generation and which was worth defending against thieves. Um, but I, I grant you, you, you have to get into the culture and imagine this shaming going on as, as people describe, where I, I can't take it anymore. They're laughing at me everywhere I go. They're, they're this and they're that. And now he's grown up in that world where he also takes it seriously, more seriously than you would, you know, or I would. I'm just guessing. But... Um, uh, forgive me, I don't, I don't have a good answer for what is the real payoff here of this atrocious behavior. And, um, you know, other than continuing to enforce, well, let me give you a, one example I meant to mention. Uh, let's say your daughter decides to outbreed. Now, suddenly, instead of having a uh, uh, offspring that you're related to by one, you're back down to a half. Because if she's outbreeding, you ain't related to that half. 
if she stays within your system, she's gonna be meeting a cousin to whom she's highly related, so that'll mean high relatedness down to the offspring, right? So, um, so I do think the, uh, the threat of uh, suddenly outbreeding a, um, is stronger, or one can see it as a, as a strong force in and of itself because you're dropping catastrophically in terms of degree of relatedness. But otherwise, I don't have a good answer for your question. I apologize for that, but there was one man that wanted to ask a question. You still want to ask a question? Short in time, we'll make it, we'll make it short. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> So you, you, you were talking about genetic background of homosexuality and heterosexuality. But if we go to bisexuality, I was wondering, is there a possibility that bisexuality is epigenetically regulated? What do you know about this? Well, I, there's nothing known about it, I can confidently say. But why did you think it might be? Well. Let's say I'm a bisexual man, and then I have certain thoughts, get into a certain mood, lock out or lock in some genes, and then I want men. And I get into another mood, then I want women. I don't yeah, know. but I don't, I don't see why that necessarily implies epigenetic, although we may be defining epigenetic differently. So... I best, I best leave that aside. Epigenetics that I think of, this generational epigenetics has to do with marks that are put on genes you may know that can survive past the generation so you can be regulating a gene in grandchildren. And we know some of our best data on epigenetics has to do with uh, uh, second generation effects of women who reproduce during warfare. And then it's, it's not just the child, it's their grandchildren that are affected by the fact that they had to spend the last four years of World War II in, in, in uh, Zagreb or wherever the hell uh, uh, the war was actively involved. You know. Okay, I will answer no more questions. All right, thank you. Let's give it up one more time for Dr. Trevor.